Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Romy Curado. I'm an attorney at Curado & Associates, and I'm here with Diana Collazo. She's also an attorney here at Curado & Associates. We want to thank you guys for joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that it should be of interest to all of us. It's probate. You're never too young to start planning your state. You're never too old to do it because we definitely want to protect your legacy. You worked so hard to be where you are, and we want to help you protect it. Here at our firm, we do different areas of law. We do real estate, probate, immigration, litigation, state planning, trademarks, and probate is an area of law that we're able to do all over the state of Florida. So regardless of where you have your state or the state is open, we can help you. For those of you realtors that are out there, we've had probate situations that have taken us maybe a month to complete, a month and a half, depending, right? Depending. So don't think that because you have a probate issue arise in one of your closings that, oh my God, it's gonna take forever. Not necessarily hire the right firm and we can make it go as smoothly as possible. We understand that you're looking to close and we wanna help you accomplish that goal. So with that said, I want to share our screen with everybody. So that way you guys can see our presentation. So just give me one second. Okay, fantastic. Everybody should be able to see our screen now. Again, it's Probit for Realtors, Romy Jurado and Diana Collazo is here with me. And that's a beautiful little cat because we happen to like cats. <laughs> so what is probate? Probate is a court supervised process for establishing the validity of the will. You use it to identify, gather the assets of the deceased person. You use it to pay the decedent's debt, and then you wind up the decedent's financial affairs and you distribute whatever is left to the beneficiaries. Um, I forgot to tell you guys, you can put any questions, any, any concerns that you have, you can put it in the chat or in the Q&A and we can answer them as we go through our presentation. I would also mention that is, you know, you don't need to have a will to go through probate. You only need to have property under your sole name. Right. So it's not like if you have a will, you go through probate. No, it's just if there are probatable assets, then you will have to go through probate. So probate administration applies to probate assets because there are certain assets that don't go through probate. Probate assets are those assets owned in the decedent's own name at death or owned by the decedent and one or more co-owners and lack provision for automatic succession. There are ways that you can have uh, things title under your name. And if you decide or you put it in that automatic succession and you put who you want it to go to, and there's ways to do that, it won't go through probate. So some examples of assets or property that may be probate assets may include a bank account or investment account in the name of the person that died. It's a probate assets. A bank account or investment account owned by the decedent and payable on death or transferable at death to another or held jointly with the rights of survivorship with another, it's not a probate assets. So for all of you guys out there and girls, right? what's the first thing that we would recommend somebody to do, the easiest estate planning thing to do? Go to the bank and name your beneficiaries. Yes, go to the bank and name your beneficiaries. If you have any bank account, you could say, look, I have this bank account, it's in my name, but if something happens to me, I want it to go automatically to X and Y person. Why? Because at the moment that you pass, if it's not payable upon death to somebody else, or if it's not held uh, with somebody else's name as joint, uh, joint tenants with rights of survivorship, then it's going to have to go through probate. Even if you only have $5,000 in the bank, $3,000 in the bank, the bank will not give you a penny unless they have a court order to do so. Or in the alternative, if you like to pre-plan, like we all should, you can go to the bank right now. Tell them you want to name your beneficiary. You want it to be payable, payable upon death upon somebody and make sure it gets done correctly because we've had situations where the people come into us because they're like, oh, my mom said this was payable upon death to me. I went to the bank, my mom passed and the bank is refusing to give me any money because they said it was never done. Sadly, people make mistakes. So just because you go to the bank and you ask them to be payable upon death to somebody, you want to verify that it is. How do you verify? Well, get the papers, get the documents, get the records. You know, it sometimes it even says it on the account. You want to make sure that it's done correctly because if it's not done correctly, it's still going to have to go through probate. And the saddest thing is to have like what, $3,000 in the bank and it has to go through probate. They end up paying us more for the probate. I mean, it's in the cost. You don't want to do that. If you're going through a difficult time, your loved one already passed, you want them to have all the money available. And doing the payable upon death, it's really the easiest thing, but people forget. So please, if you take anything out of this presentation, go do that today. 
All right. A life insurance policy, annuity contract, or individual retirement account payable to the decedent state is a probate asset. A life insurance policy, annuity contract, or individual retirement account to a beneficiary may not be a probate asset. If you have life insurance, if you have retirement accounts, what do you need to do? Name your beneficiaries, mm -hmm. right? And one um, caveat or thing we want to tell you guys is we don't want to put your children as beneficiaries. You do not, if they're minor, if you have minor children, do not name them as beneficiaries of your policy, your insurance policy, your retirement accounts. And Diana's going to explain to you guys why. Yes, you might need to get a guardian appointed to represent their interest in court. That's, that's going to be the issue. Exactly. So if you put your children as beneficiaries and they're minor children and something happens to you, a guardian is going to have to be appointed. And if that's the case, that's an extra expense that they're going to have to go through. Also, if you put your, you know, let's say you did put your children as beneficiaries, a guardian is appointed until they're 18. And then at 18, they get it outright. You may not want your children to get that money outright. You may want them to, you know, because let's face it, at 18, we're all a little immature. So you may want, especially me, I was too. You may want them to receive something when they're 25, something when they're 30, something when they're 35. You know, you want to protect them. So you, my, the best solution that we recommend is create a trust. Create a trust and you can name the trust the beneficiary of your life insurance, of your retirement account. And now the trust says, okay, they're gonna, the children are gonna receive the benefit, but they're not gonna get it outright when they're 18. They're gonna get some when they're 25, some when they're 30, 35, or they may never get it. They just receive the benefit of it and you're protecting them because what you don't want is for them to just get it and lose it, you know? Also, Let's say that you have a, you know, a, a spouse or whoever you want to leave your stuff to. If they are subject to lawsuits, if they have judgments against them and they get something outright, guess who's going to get that? The judgment creditors. If you plan and you do it through a trust and there are certain ways to prepare trust so they're not subject to creditor garnishment, um, you are going to be able to protect that. So let's talk about it. Let's think about your strategy and we can come up with something that will help you protect your legacy and the people you want to leave it to. All right. So let's see. What is the standard probate time through court? Well, we're going to discuss that in a bit because there's different types of probates um, and it depends what probate you have to give you an idea how long it's going to take. So we're going to do that in just a bit. So again, life insurance policy, annuity contract, or individually retirement account, it's not a probate asset, okay? If it goes out right off to the beneficiary, it's a probate asset if the state is a beneficiary, and it's not a probate asset if you put your trust as a beneficiary, and through your trust, you're able to correctly plan. I have advised you do not put your children as beneficiaries, if they're minor, because you're going to face an issue regarding guardianship, and that's going to be extra money on your, that you're going to have to spend. Also, real estate title in the sole name of the decedent or the decedent's name and another person as tenants in common is a probate asset. Unless it's homestead property, real estate title in the name of the decedent and one or more other persons as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, it's not a probate asset. Also, property owned by spouses as tenants by the entirety is not a probate asset on death of the first spouse to die, but it goes automatically to the surviving spouse. So let's break that into a little parts. What is and what isn't a probate asset? So if real estate is owned in the person's name together with another person, it's a probate asset, mm -hmm. tenants in common. What makes it not a probate asset is if they have what? Rights of survivorship, right? So if Diana and I own a house as joint tenants, so we own it together 50-50, and that's it. We just, own it. we just own it as joint tenants. If I die, my, my part will go through probate. If she passes, her part will go through probate. If we own it as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, that means when I pass, it automatically goes to her. And when she passes, it automatically goes to me. So it doesn't go through probate. In Florida, we have something called tenancy by the entireties. This is available to husband and wife or husband and husband or wife and wife. Legally married people are able to buy and acquire real estate property, also personal property, and it's a non-divisible interest. What does that mean? Each of them owns 100% of the asset together at the same time. So when one of them passes, it automatically goes to the other spouse and it does not go through probate. So joint tenants with rights to survivorship do not go through probate. Tenancy by the entireties do not go through probate. Tenants in common, it goes through probate, okay? 
Okay, so when is probate necessary? Probate may be necessary to transfer ownership of the decedent's assets to the decedent's beneficiaries. If the decedent's left a valid will, the court would admit the will according to the procedures to probate to transfer ownership of probate assets to the named beneficiaries. If the decedent had no will, probate may be necessary to pass ownership of the decedent's probate assets to those receiving them under Florida law. Some assets do not require probate proceedings to transfer ownership. Probate may also be necessary to wind up the decedent's financial affair. An administration of the decedent's state ensures that the decedent's creditor are paid if certain procedures are correctly followed. Can you tell us a little bit about the creditors, Diana, and what happens when a probate state is open with regards to creditors? Okay, so the creditors usually have up to two years, basically, two years to file claims against the state. But, you know, if you open up a formal administration, you can reduce that period to a three-month period. So once the personal representative gets appointed, the first thing that they need to do is to publish in the newspaper so that the creditors' period gets reduced to three months. So if you so typically creditors have two years to come after a state. But if you publish, then you only three months? Three and if months. in three months they don't come after the state, then sayonara, we don't have to pay them? Sayonara, unless they're reasonable, ascertainable creditors, which is another. Thing. <laughs> See, so it's good to understand and do this. So I know I have a lot of realtors out there. So let's focus on what is probate real estate. So it's very simple, kind of. So whether it's an heir, a seller or buyer, the definition of probate real estate really never changes. Someone owned real estate. Now that someone can be a Florida resident, a foreigner, anybody owned real estate in their own name that person died. And in order for the rightful heirs to have title to the real estate, to sell it, convey it, transfer, the heirs have to go through this formal call, a process called probate to officially transfer title. So anytime a person, whether as a foreigner or a US person or somebody that lives in New Jersey, anytime they own real estate in their name, if they pass, assuming that there is no joint tenants with private survivorship and the other stuff that I mentioned, it's going to have to go through probate here in Florida. So we do probates here in Florida for anybody. It could be anywhere in the world. As long as they have property in Florida, it's going to have to go through probate. As a realtor, you cannot sell it. No title company can convey it unless there's a court order authorizing that. So that's really important to think about. Now, we have clients, and I'm sure you have clients that are New York residents, and they have property here in Florida. They have property anywhere else. So what can we do so they don't have to open up a probate in Florida, a probate in Ohio, and a probate in Alabama. But we can do a trust. So let's say you're, you're a Florida resident and you're going to own property all over the United States. You can do a Florida trust and you can title your property all over the United States in the name of that trust so that when you pass away, you don't have to open ancillary probate here, ancillary probate here. It goes through your trust and there is no probate needed in each of these states. Otherwise, yes, you will have to open up a probate here in Florida in order to sell Florida property if it's in your name. Mm -hmm. All right. So somebody's asking us about the fees for probate. We're going to we're going to send everybody a follow up email and it's going to include hopefully this presentation, a video to this and some information regarding fee structure. We are really reasonable with our fees and we work with realtors who are trying to sell probate property so we can accommodate and we can probably get paid at closing depending on the situation. So we will work with you. We want to help you guys out. Um, what is the difference between rights of survivorship and tenants by the entirety? Okay, that's a great question. So you want to tell us a little bit about the difference? Okay, right of survivorship, you usually put that in, in the in the in the on the deed of the of the to the property. So when you are dealing with tenants in the in the entirety, it's usually husband and wife who purchase the property together during their marriage. Exactly. So the main difference is basically that for you to get tenancy by the entireties, you have to be husband and wife, husband and husband, wife and wife. For you to have joint tenants with rights of survivorship, you don't have to be married. You can do this with anybody. You can acquire property, joint tenants with rights of survivorship. If either of you dies, it goes to the other person automatically. Mm -hmm. So, but tenancy by the entireties is you could only be husband and husband, wife and wife, or wife and husband. So the application itself is the same because what's going to happen is if one of you dies, it automatically goes to the other. It's just that you cannot do tenancy by the entireties unless you're legally married. Okay, so why should realtors care about probate? Well, first, you want to avoid wasting time. What if you found a property and you're so happy to list it later to find out the person that gave you the property had no rights to sell the property because they are not 
first of all, they're not the authorized representative. They're not the personal representative, which we're going to explain to you what that is. Or they're not, you would need to what, get all the heirs to agree, correct? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to waste your time. We don't want you to waste your time either. You might be dealing with the wrong person. Because mm -hmm. unless you're dealing with the individual who's appointed personal representative by the court, you need to make sure that all of the heirs are agreeing to the sale. Otherwise, they can simply say, we never agreed. And then there's nothing you can do to hold them accountable. You want to make sure that your contract is subject to court approval. How long it's going to take, it depends on the type of probate. It depends whether they're creditors or they're people fighting the will, whatever it is. So it just depends. I remember we did my probate, not my probate, I am still alive, but I purchased, I was purchasing a property and the person had a will mm -hmm. from his dad giving him and this and his brother the property and nothing was done when I got involved. And then we found out about the probate that needed to be done. And we did it in how long? Like a month. Like a month. Because yes, yeah. I was so sad. I'm like, Diana, you need to hurry up so we can close this. I need to buy this ASAP. And we were able to do a probate in a month and we, I was able to buy the property. So just because it's a probate, it's a court procedure. I don't think it's going to take too long. If you hire the right attorneys, we can find a strategy and see if we can do it quicker. If we can, we will do so to help you as best as possible. So there's two different types of probate. Um, or no, there's, yeah, there is two or three different types of probate, but there's two ways that we approach probate. One is a person has a will and it's called testate or a person doesn't have a will and it's called intestate. And we're going to explain to you how that works. Okay, so test a succession. When the decedent has a valid will, that's another one because they can have a will and it can be invalid, right? Yeah, and that's going to delay the entire process too. Yes, but when a decedent has a valid will, the role of the probate court is to distribute the property according to the decedent's instructions in the will. You, They also appoint the personal representative as indicated in your will unless it's at summary administration. They find out uh, if the decedent left the will requires the custodian or if a will to deposit the original with the clerk of the court within 10 days of receiving the information that testator is dead. So if they don't have the original will, what happens? You can actually admit a copy of the will, but you need to be very careful. You need a witness to basically appear and testify that this is the, this is the last will of the testator that you didn't know that he intended to revoke the will, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's going to require a little, a little bit of extra work. I see. So you need to keep the original will in a safe place. Yes. Uh, through a will, you can nominate guardians for your minor children. Yes, you can do that. And you should, because you don't, maybe you're, I don't know, divorced and you don't want your spouse <laughs> to be the guardian. So you want to put it there, you know, assuming you guys don't have joint custody. Um, and a will can be used to disinherit a specific individuals. Yes, we have clients who wanted to disinherit their rowdy children. They were old already. They were older, so they were able to disinherit them, no problem. You can do all these things with a will, but you have to make sure that it's valid. And we're going to talk about what makes a valid will. Because the saddest thing is when somebody comes to our office, they're ready to do a probate, we look at the will, and we're like, this will is not valid. <laughs> you know, It has no witnesses. It wasn't properly notarized or it's signed at the beginning instead of the end. So you want to make sure that the will is valid. And then if the will is invalid, or if the person doesn't have a will, now the probate process is called intestate succession. And this Florida statutes that you see there tells us who gets what. Okay, so this is a little chart that we will share with you that basically tells us, we ask, you know, certain questions. Was the person that died married? If yes, did they have children? If no, uh, do they have parents? If no, do they have siblings? You know, if the person was not married, did they have children? So we go through this analysis through intestate succession to see who will inherit the assets, but we don't have to go through this. If you properly plan, maybe you don't want your sister to inherit from you, I don't know. Do a will, correct? And disinherit them if you don't want them to inherit something and decide. We have people that wanted to leave everything to, you know, to, to a school for a scholarship. That's fine. You can do whatever you want. This is your money. This is your legacy. You can decide where it goes. Don't let the state of Florida decide where it goes. And the only way to decide where this goes is through a will or through a trust. So make sure that you do that. Otherwise, uh, the court's going to decide according to a system that's called Persterpes. Persterpes, think about a tree with little branches. Mm -hmm. And we would have to go through this analysis so that, you know, somebody will inherit. If at the end of the day, there is nobody that under Persterpes receives your assets, then what happens? Goes to the state. It goes to the state. Okay. We don't want you to give the state your money unless you want to. So now we're going to talk about the types of probate and how long, just to give you an idea, how long we think it's going to take.
And those are two beautiful cats and dogs. We love cats and dogs, right, Diana? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about summary administration. Tell us a little bit about summary administration. It's very simple. It doesn't require a lot. It, it requires you to identify all the assets from the beginning. You know what's going to be distributed during the probate. And usually it cannot exceed, it exceed $75,000 unless, unless the, the person who passed has been deceased for more than two years. Then you can do that even if the state is worth more than 75,000. So if somebody died more than two years ago and they have $3 million in assets, we can do summary administration? We should be able to. Okay, that's great. And how long does that take? Well, it depends, you know, like, do, do you, did you properly identify the heirs? Like, you know, like, are they in conflict as to who gets what? It, it, so if nobody's in conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could take really little, but you need to make sure that the taxes were, you know, paid, depending, etc. You need to take those things into consideration. Okay, so in summary, summary administration, if the person died two years or less, we can do it as long as the assets don't exceed $75,000. Homestead property, let's say they have a homestead property for $500,000, we can still do summary administration, correct? The mm -hmm. homestead property does not count towards a $75,000 uh, money uh, limitation. So if there's homestead property and $60,000 worth of assets, we can do some administration and it's a fairly faster process, assuming the heirs are not fighting. Yes. If uh, we have less than $75,000, we can do some administration. If the person died more than two years ago, regardless of what assets they have, we can probably do summary administration as well. So what do we do? We talk to you and we see what happened, what assets there are, when did the person die, and then we can see if we can do a summary administration too. Sometimes you start with summary and sometimes you can switch to the other one, correct? Or how does that work? Yes, but you know, it de depending on the county, some counties may ask you to pay for the fee again to change it from a summary to a formal administration. Because sometimes people don't know, sadly, that they have more than $75,000 and then yeah. they start digging and then they see. So what I wanted to convey is just because you started with a summary and then you found more assets doesn't mean, okay, I lost all the assets. No, you probably can change it. They may ask you to pay the fee again. They may yeah. not. It depends on the county. We do um, probate all over the state of Florida. So we will just, you know, we'll work with the county and see if sometimes they allow it without paying the filing fee again. And if you have to pay the filing fee, hey, there's more assets. So you might as well do it. Let's see if we have other questions. I don't see other questions. Okay. So. Formal administration. Tell us about that. That's a more longer process, correct? Yeah, this is this is very useful, especially when you have uh, you don't know who the heirs are, or you know that the heirs are there, but they're not really responsive. So you need to just give them notification, make sure that they get notification, and even if they don't res respond, then you're going to be able to proceed with your with your case. Um, this is you're going to get a personal representative appointed by the judge. Usually it is the person that is uh, nominated in the in the will, but if there is no will, then you know, you, usually the spouse. There is like a, a process. The the statute tell you tells you who is the first one to get um, appointed personal representative. Like there is like an order of preference, basically. Okay, perfect. So formal administration is the one that you do if the assets exceed seventy five thousand dollars, or if the decedent has been dead for less than two years and you want to get a personal representative appointed. Also, it's recommended when you have multiple creditors and you need to provide formal notice to reduce that creditor time period. If you don't provide formal notice, the creditors have up to two years to come after the state. If you provide formal notice, then they have three months. So you want to shorten the time that they have to claim anything against the state. Mm -hmm. Also, the banks won't tell you any information unless you have a personal representative. So we need to be careful with that. So what is a valid will? So for a will to be valid, it must be in writing signed by the decedent and witness and comply with the execution requirements set by Florida law. In a will, the decedent can name the beneficiaries who the decedent wants to receive the decedent's probate assets. The decedent can also designate a personal representative, Florida's term for executor, to administer the probate state. So you can decide who is going to be your personal representative and they are compensated, correct? Up to 3%. Yeah, they can be compensated, but, you know, it could exceed that amount, like you mentioned. If it's more work, then the personal representative can be paid more. Yeah, if you're so, selling the property, for instance, during the probate. Then it's going to be a little bit more work. Okay, so Florida statute 732.501 
provide that any person of sound minds, either 18 years of age or more, or an emancipated minor may make a will. So if you're 18 years of age or more, or you're an emancipated minor, you can make a will. It must be signed by the testator, that's the person doing the will, at the end of the document. If the testator is unable to sign for some reason, the document, then some other person may subscribe the testator's name at the end of the document in the testator's present and by the testator's direction. If you have a situation where your mom or whoever your family member is elderly or you know incapacitated and they cannot sign, I would highly advise you to get the whole signature part recorded with previous authorization so that there is no question that the testator asked somebody else to sign their name. Otherwise, you're going to face issues. So I would highly advise also if there is a situation where your family member was, wants to disinherit somebody that might be receiving uh, you know, an inheritance to regular Florida law, you might want to videotape that too because you don't want them to say that you tricked them into doing it or something like that. So it's always a good idea to do that just to be safe with their authorization, of course. Also, in order for a will to be valid, it must be witnessed by at least two attesting witnesses who also must sign the will in the presence of the testator and in the presence of each other. So you need 18 years of age or emancipated minor. The testator, the person doing the will, needs to sign the will at the end of the document or somebody else at the testator's direction needs to sign the will at the end of the document. And you need to have two subscribing witnesses signing the will in the presence of each other and in the presence of the testator. Let's talk about the subscribing witnesses and when we do an affidavit so that you don't have to go chasing around for the subscribing witnesses. Yes. So you have something called at the end of the um, a self-proving affidavit. You, you attach it to the end of the will. It's notarized, but it has to have the proper notarization. It has to, it has to mention what identification the notary used. Like sometimes they forget to, to say that it, or whether they personally know you. Okay, so if okay, so usually if they don't have a self-proving affidavit, when the will gets probated, they have to go chasing around for the witnesses that witness the will. If you have a self-proving affidavit, then you don't need to go around chasing the witnesses. So you definitely want to include a self-proving affidavit that is properly executed yes. so that you can admit the will into probate with no issues as to where are the witnesses. You don't want to be chasing witnesses. Many things can happen. They might not even be here anymore. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about homestead property. So if the owner of the property has a home in Florida that is his or her homestead, right? Then, um, or primary resident, then there's certain, ex not exemptions, there is certain situations where you cannot devise it out. So if you have homestead property, you cannot take it away from your spouse or your minor child. Mm -hmm. That's it. There is a protection in the Florida constitution. I cannot devise my homestead property to the other. I have to give it to my spouse or my minor child. That's it. There's no exceptions. In Florida, there is protection. Unless somehow your spouse waived her right to the property through a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement, maybe that's the case. And then there's a lot of fighting on that. So we need to make sure. So Florida statutes provide that if not devised as authorized by Florida law, the surviving spouse shall take a life state in the homestead property with a vested remainder in the decedents or the decedent per stirpe. The surviving spouse may elect to take half of the homestead as a tenant in common with the remaining undivided on half interest in the homestead on the decedent's descendants per stirpe. So what does that mean? If you have a homestead property, it goes to your spouse if your children are together with your spouse, correct? Mm -hmm. If your spouse, if you have children that are not your, is your spouse's child, then your spouse gets a life state, right? And then it goes to your children. Mm -hmm. But there is an option for the spouse. They can also, you know, within six months from from having the from from your dad, basically within six months, she can elect to take half of the homestead property in that situation. Okay, perfect. So what do we do? We sit down with you. We analyze what the situation is with the property, and then we see who can get what, and then we go from there. There's also something called a preterminate spouse. So when a person makes a will and marries after the making of the will, the surviving spouse generally gets what she would have gotten if the decedent died intestate, unless there is a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement addressing the issue, the will provides for the spouse, the will clearly discloses that it does not intend to make a provision for the spouse, 
uh, important that surviving spouse could request an elective share. So there are two instances when you need to think about state planning. I mean, you should think about state planning all the time, but maybe updating your documents. One is when you're planning to get married because you don't want to disinherit your spouse uh, without you know, realizing it. So you want to think about that. What do you want to leave that person? How are you going to work it out? What's the best way to avoid probate or go through probate? Whatever you decide to do. Also, when you divorce. So I've seen cases where people get divorced and 10 years pass, 20 years pass. Mm -hmm. The spouse dies and then the heirs, the mom, the children, they go to get the state going, right? And they're surprised that, for example, the spouse had a retirement account that named the previous spouse or the spouse had... Um, well, a life insurance policy that named the previous spouse. Mm -hmm. So don't think that just because you do your estate planning today and you go to the bank, you name somebody as pay upon not death, you do your life insurance policy, you do your retirement account, your 401k, and you name, or your, you know, you can even say your stocks and bonds and you say that goes payable upon this person. And you're doing all of this to plan for your spouse because you're so in love and you're so happy. And then you get divorced and you forget to take them out of everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're going to get everything. Just because you get divorced and you get, uh, what is it, a marital settlement agreement that says that they're not going to get anything, that's not the way that it goes with the probate with the non-probate assets you already have. Yeah. So you have to go to insurance company, you have to go through the, your retirement account, you have to look at your stocks and bonds, and at the moment that you get divorced, you want to make sure you say, hey, this person is no longer getting a penny from me, unless you want them to get your money. That's totally fine, too, is whatever they decide. Well, there is a similar situation when you have a new child and, you know, the child is not provided in the will because, you know, the child was born afterwards. So you need to update your estate planning documents. Yes, absolutely. So estate planning documents, you're getting married you're having a child, mm -hmm. you're getting divorced, okay? So all those times, we wanna update your state planning documents and you wanna update all of your beneficiaries that you've named through your retirement account, bank account, um, insurance, life insurance, and all of that. Okay, somebody's asking us a question. What is the home? What if the home is only deeded to the husband and not the wife? Well, if you, depends, right? If it's homestead property, mm -hmm. you automatically have a right to it, whether your name is on title or not. That's a protection from the Florida Constitution. If it's not your homestead property and it's only deeded to the husband and he dies, well, what does his will say? If his will says it goes to you, it goes to you. If he doesn't have a will, then it goes per surpiece and they think the wife gets it, right? Yeah, like you have to take a look also like... Um... It's, it's, it's a lot of, it is a lot of factors because the wife also has a right to the elective chair and all those, that scenario. So it's not a clear answer. Let us sit down with you, look yeah. at the deed and tell you who will get what. The easiest thing would be to plan beforehand, especially if you're not on title so that you're not facing any issues later. So what if a person dies without a will or legal heirs pursuant to the statute 732.107 property reverts back to the state, Florida, as a last resort. The property is sold and the proceeds paid to the chief financial officer of the state. These cheated funds are retained as part of the state school fund. So it does go to something good. I went to public school, so and she did too. We actually went to the same school, but we didn't meet each other there. It was funny. And after 10 years, the state rights to the proceeds become absolute. So, I mean, listen, if you wanted to go to the public school, that's great. If you don't, that's fine too. Then properly do your state plan so this doesn't happen. We've been mentioning the word personal representative. And let's explain to you what it is, what do they do, and why are they so important? Yeah, that is uh, the personal representative is basically the person who is... Uh, going to administer your state on your behalf when you're dead, you know, when that person has to notify the creditors, that person has to pay the taxes, that person has to take care of everything pretty much and make it, and also they need to make sure to properly identify the heirs, etc. And that personal representative person can get compensated from the state. It could be 3%, it could be more if they're selling property. So it's not a job that they do for free, right? Because they have to do a lot of work. They have to notify all the heirs and interested parties that the will is being submitted to probate, identify and take control of any state assets. They have to file the tax returns with an appropriate accountant and pay the taxes. They have to pay the creditor's claim. They have to manage the assets or the investments. They have to sell the assets to satisfy any claims. They have to file the necessary documents, distribute the assets to the share, and then prepare and submit the final accounting to the court. Now, 
as probate attorneys, we help the personal representative do all of this. You know, we work with other professionals too. I've had wills where the person says, listen, uh, this is going to be my personal representative and I want her to sell this and this property, but I want them to use this realtor when they sell this and this property. You could put that as part of the will too. Uh, your clients can put that. So that way the personal representative is not left out in the cold. They will work with this CPA. They will work with this realtor. They will work with this attorney. Um, even this, uh, they, they always put, they sometimes put too when they have funds and we're doing trust that they want them to work with this financial advisor to properly manage the trust assets. That's fine too. You can put all of this in your state planning documents so that you can properly protect your heirs, okay? But in conclusion, the personal representative does do a lot of work with the help of other professionals and they can get compensated. So how is this personal representative appointed, right? So under 733, under Florida Statute 733.301, the following is the preferred order in appointing a personal representative. If it's a testate state, meaning the person died with a will, then the personal representative is his or her successor nominated by the will. You decide who's going to be your personal representative, okay? Mm -hmm. If the person, it could be the person selected by the majority in interest of the beneficiaries, okay? And if they're, if they don't agree, then the court can also select a more qualified personal representative, mm -hmm. right? And what happens if you die without a will? What is the little order that we have? First goes to the surviving spouse, that um, then to the person selected by the majority of the of the beneficiaries, and then you know the court may decide to who's the more qualified. There are many. So if you don't want your spouse to be a personal representative, name your personal representative in your will. Otherwise, they will be designed to be your personal representative. And make sure that that person qualifies too. <laughs> yes, make sure the person qualifies. So who qualifies? So under Florida Statute 733, uh, sorry, period 302, any person who is sui juris and is a resident of Florida at the time of the death of the person whose state is to be administered qualifies to be a personal representative, okay? That person cannot have been convicted of a felony. So if your wife is felonious, do not put her as your personal representative. They're not gonna qualify. Convicted of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of an elderly person or a disabled adult in any jurisdiction, okay? So no abusers. Mentally or physically unable to perform the duties of a personal representative or it's under the age of 18. So if the person you want to nominate falls under any of those categories, they're not going to be qualified to be a personal representative. Under 733.304, a non-resident of the state of Florida may qualify, because I mentioned that you needed to be a Florida resident. However, you might be a personal representative in being a non-resident of the state of Florida as long as the person is a legally adopted child or adopted parent of the decedent, related by lineal consanguinity to the decedent, a spouse or brother, sister, uncle, aunt, nephew, or niece of the decedent, or someone related by lineal consanguinity to any such persons, the spouse of a person otherwise qualified under this section. So if you want to name a foreigner, somebody that's not a Florida resident as your personal representative, make sure that they qualify under any of these. Otherwise, they're not going to be allowed to be your personal representative. And then the court will decide who is your personal representative. Because I have people that, uh, foreigners, right? They want us to do their documents and they want to name a personal representative to be their attorney abroad. And under these regulations, they wouldn't qualify because they're not related by consanguinity. And unless they're the spouse of somebody that is, they're not going to qualify to be the personal representative. How to avoid probate? A lot of people want to know. So how do we avoid probate? What can we do? So generally, probate will not be necessary in the following scenarios. One, we discussed this tenancy by the entireties, husband and wife, husband and husband, wife and wife, purchase real estate as a married couple, and one spouse revives the other, the other spouse automatically gets the property. No probate necessary if that's the only asset. Joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Whoever sub survives gets titled to the property. You can do that. You don't need to be married, but you need to have the magical language within the deed that says joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Life state deed. So a life state is when you say it's mine while I'm, sorry, I have the right to occupy it while I'm alive, but it automatically passes to person X upon my death. So that avoids probate as well. So upon the death of the life tenant, the remainder man becomes the owner automatically, no need for probate. Mm -hmm. Trust, the trustee has the right to transfer the property. I love trust. Let's start doing a trust. You can decide through a trust how your assets are managed, 
everything, you know, how much they get, whether they get it outright or they don't, until what age, what are trigger events where they wouldn't get it. You can decide all of this via trust. A trust is the only document that allows you to manage your state, even if you're not here to make decisions because you plan it out and you know your family or your friends better than most. So you plan out how you want your assets distributed or not distributed or taken care of. Also, we talked about this designated beneficiary. So typically when you designate a beneficiary for a bank account, life insurance, annuity contract, or retirement, a retirement account, the money goes to the beneficiary without probate. Please do not put your minor children as beneficiaries because now you're thinking you're avoiding probate. Now you have to start a guardianship proceeding because minors cannot just take it. So, and you may not want your minor child to get everything at 18. I sh I'm sure I don't want, I have two beautiful daughters. They're young. They're a year and eight months and eight months. I don't, I'm, I know they're going to be really mature, but at 18, nobody really is. I wouldn't want them to get everything at 18. I want them to get it little by little. I want to provide for their future, not just for their teen years. So you can plan all of this via correct state plan. All right. That's it for our presentation, but we're ready to keep on taking more questions. So let's see. I have any more questions, okay. Hmm. Oh, people are telling me you love the cat pictures. Thank you, I appreciate that. We do have a nonprofit. We raise funds for the benefits of homeless cats. If you ever wanna contribute, it's cookattorneysatpa.org. Anyway, going back to our presentation, uh, let me stop sharing my screen. We want you guys to see us as a resource. I understand that probate is a topic not many people wanna think about, but if there's anything that we can answer, we do offer free consultations in regards to probate. So if you even think it's gonna be a probate issue, you wanna know how to handle it, give us a call, reach out. You can call me, Romy, you can call Diana, and we can advise you about probate all over the state of Florida, free of charge for you and your clients. We also do state planning. You can properly plan your state. We do uh, company formations, which you can also do as part of your state plan forming companies. We do real estate closings in the whole state of Florida. And if we see a probate issue, we're doing a closing, we're going to let you know so we can handle it. Litigation, because sadly people are very litigious here in Florida as well. We help with that also. Trademarks, copyrights, and any type of business contracts and business purchases and sales. I do all the closings for those and the documents in regards to that. We hope you've enjoyed our presentation. I want to thank you so much for accompanying us here today. We know that your time is valuable and we thank you so much for attending. I will send everybody a follow-up email probably tomorrow with the slides and the presentation and hopefully a video of us. And if there's any other topic you guys want, to, want us to talk about, let us know. You could also check out our future webinars under romijurado.com forward slash events. I have all of the webinars there that we have upcoming. Thank you so much for everything. Anything Bye. else you want to say? Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.